Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our 2017 Terry Sanford Distinguished Lecture, A Conversation with Lisa Monaco, Counterterrorism in the Trump Era. Uh, I'm Sally Kornbluth. I'm the provost here at Duke. And I'm very pleased to be here to kick off the year-long commemoration of Terry Sanford's centennial birthday. I want to uh, especially welcome any first-year students here this evening. It's really wonderful that you're here taking advantage of the program tonight. Learning from distinguished scholars and practitioners who visit our university is really a valuable part of your whole Duke experience. So our event tonight is sponsored by the Sanford School of Public Policy, the Triangle Center on Terrorism and Homeland Security, and the American Grand Strategy Program. Thank you to all the faculty and staff who've uh, made this possible. The Terry Sanford Distinguished Lecture is made possible by a gift to the university from the William R. Keenan Jr. Charitable Trust in honor of the late Terry Sanford. So as I'm sure many of you know, Terry Sanford is a much beloved figure in North Carolina and at Duke University. He dedicated his life to ethical leadership and public life. Sanford served as the governor of North Carolina from 1961 to 1965, focusing his tenure on strengthening education, combating poverty, and expanding civil rights. Sanford doubled state expenditures on public education. He supported desegregation when other governors were blocking African American students from entering university gates. Building on his commitment to public service, when Sanford was president of Duke University, he established an institute for policy sciences and public affairs to serve as an interdisciplinary program to train future leaders. Now the institute uh, then evolved and now stands as where you are, the Sanford School of Public Policy, which supports the primary appointment of over 80 faculty and researchers and houses one of Duke's largest undergraduate majors, two master's programs, a PhD program, and multiple research centers. In keeping with the spirit of Terry Sanford, the purpose of the, this distinguished lecture is to bring campus men and women of the highest personal and professional stature to present to the Duke community. Our Terry Sanford lecturer this evening is Lisa Monaco. This year, Ms. Monaco left the government after 20 years in public service. She obtained degrees from the University of Chicago and the Harvard Law School, and soon thereafter became counsel to Attorney General Janet Reno. After serving as federal prosecutor for six years, FBI Director Robert Mueller hired her to be a special counsel, deputy chief of staff, and chief, then chief of staff. In 2009, Monaco returned to a senior position in the Justice Department, and in 2011, was appointed by President Obama and confirmed by the US Senate to be Assistant Attorney General for National Security. In 2013, President Obama appointed her to be his assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. In this role, Ms. Monaco was the President's Chief Advisor on Foreign and Domestic Terrorism, Cybersecurity, and Pandemic and Natural Disaster Response. She served in the White House for the entire second term of the Obama presidency. Currently, she is a senior fellow at the NYU Law School and Harvard's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. So uh, you all may or may not know that Terry Sanford was an FBI agent for two years. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II, and then after the war, obtained a law degree from UNC. I think he would have been fascinated by uh, Lisa's career and proud to have her speaking at the uh, Sanford School. Our moderator for tonight's event is the Sanford School's own David Shanzer. David overlapped many years with Lisa in Washington during his own career in public service, and he's now an associate professor of public policy and director of our Triangle Center on Terrorism and Homeland Security. So before uh, we begin, it would be great if everyone would silence their cell phones. Um, and uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Lisa to Sanford for this uh, very interesting topic. Well, Lisa Monaco, there is not an inch of space left in this building. Uh, I don't know, do you have a secret social media uh, following at Duke, uh, perhaps? Not but secret it's, anymore, I guess. It's fantastic, and uh, let me uh, uh, echo uh, the provost. Uh, welcome to Duke. We're so happy Thank to have you. you. Thank you. It is great, great, great to be here. Thank you very much. Great. Well, let's, let's dive uh, yeah. right in. Uh, uh, I want to start with an issue that's really in the headlines and on really everybody's uh, minds uh, this past almost two weeks. Uh, which is these historic uh, storms that have caused uh, such devastation in the Caribbean and, and, uh, and Texas and Florida. And, and our, uh, our hearts at uh, the Duke community, of course, go out to all those people who are still suffering, trying to recover uh, from these storms. And the pictures in the Keys and in Houston and the, especially those islands are devastating. Mm -hmm. But I know that you, uh, even when you entered the White House in uh, 2013, mm -hmm. Uh, that's uh, six, and a half, six and a half years after Katrina. A big yeah. part of your responsibilities were still 
uh, hurricane recovery uh, yeah. issues. So I wanted to ask you, what are the big issues kind of heading down the pike that the Trump administration is not, you know, uh, is going to be very serious issues about cleanup, recovery, rebuilding, uh, and what should they be doing to kind of prepare for very, very difficult uh, public policy issues that are coming their way? Well, um, thanks, David, for having me here, and thank you, um, Sally, for the introduction. Uh, you know, it, when I was preparing to come down here, um, uh, I also saw that uh, Duke, in many different forms, is pouring out its heart and um, uh, help to the communities down there. So, uh, really, hats off to this community. And I, I got to sit down with uh, some students and fellows uh, over the course of the afternoon I, that I've been here, and I've already been wowed uh, <laughs> by uh, the folks here and uh, the work that you're doing. So it's really, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, look, uh, Irma and Harvey, kind of a one-two punch uh, that has uh, befallen uh, the South uh, and the Southeast. The, the immediate issues, uh, I think, are going to be uh, in restoring power, uh, particularly, uh, obviously, in South Florida, and getting crews in to uh, get access to roads, to be able to get basic subsistence material in, generators, water, food, et cetera. FEMA is going to have to operate, and it's already doing, and I, th I think you know, our, our kudos should go to Brock Long and the, and the, the administrator of FEMA and the, um, the experts there who really have been doing, I think, a, a magnificent job uh, trying to manage uh, both of these crises and bring the federal government's uh, assistance to bear. In the immediate term, it's power, uh, continued uh, rescue operations, uh, getting uh, subsistence materials in there. Over the longer term, from a strictly White House perspective, and having been in a role that, that had me juggling a number of different crises, and not only responding to the crisis, but, and this sounds boring, but focusing on the long-term implementation, right? Maintaining focus. This is a challenge for any White House, right? After the cameras go away, after the breaking news banners go away, uh, there, there is a lot of hard work of implementing um, the recovery. And that means bringing uh, a full suite of tools to bear. It means housing recovery. This is a big issue in Katrina. We ended up having the then Secretary of Housing, uh, Sean Donovan, chairing an interagency task force with everybody from HHS, the Health and Human Services, to the Army Corps of Engineers, understanding and thinking about how they were going to provide uh, housing, rebuild at a resilient level. Uh, to, so focusing on, on the housing issues, you know, hundreds of thousands of people being displaced in, in Florida alone. Um, environmental issues health issues, toxins in the flood water. So there's a whole uh, range of issues that the federal government is going to have to continue to focus on. Maintaining that White House leadership and focus is a real challenge as the crises from uh, foreign and domestic will continue uh, to come at officials in the White House. So that means setting up a structure that can uh, be led from the White House with very clear goals and objectives to continue to implement uh, and it's going to be not weeks, not days, but, um, but months and years uh, for this recovery effort. Yeah. Uh, so let's turn uh, to the second huge issue in the headlines. The Security Council, of course, uh, just this week uh, imposed uh, a new, another round of sanctions on uh, North Korea. I want to kind of get to the uh, high-level principle here. I mean, our policy in North Korea, or our position on North Korea for a long time has been that uh, Kim Jong-un should give up, or the North Korean government should give up its nuclear weapons programs and, and denuclearize. And I wanted to ask you just right from the get-go, is, is that a realistic uh, position anymore? Is there any possibility that Kim, who essentially believes that this, uh, uh, these nuclear weapons are what is preventing him from being in the same boat as Saddam Hussein and uh, Gaddafi, <laughs> both of whom either didn't get a nuclear weapons program or gave up their program, uh, he certainly doesn't want to follow in their path, and, and he sees us as the guarantee against that. Yeah. So what conceivable po set of policies could actually ever persuade him to, to give those up? Or is that train left the station? So, um, look, I think we have to step back when we think about what ought to be our objective here, right? And let's think about who is this guy, right? Who is Kim Jong-un? Now, 
uh, I and others have used words like he's unhinged um, and you know, trying to send the message that um, he is not a rational actor. Well, the fact of the matter is um, he is exceedingly paranoid. He is indescribably violent, but he's rational. Why do I say he's rational? He's rational because he is, and it gets at the, the, what you just said, David, um, he is focused on, as his ancestry has been, on maintaining the regime's hold uh, on uh, North Korea. And he does view his nuclear capability as his ace in the hole. So I'm with Jim Clapper and other experts on this, which is to say that denuclear, nuclear, denuclearization is, um, is really not realistic. Uh, it does not seem, uh, at least there's no, uh, I haven't seen any signs that that's realistic. Uh, we should be focused, I think, on deterrence. And uh, I will also say that a key ingredient of deterrence is a credible threat of military action. So while I have differed and have done so publicly with some of the rhetoric on this about fire and fury and the like, uh, I do believe a clear, consistent message, such as the one Secretary Mattis recently delivered, of military options being on the table, as unattractive as they are, is an important element uh, of deterrence. So uh, if we are ultimately going to have to rely on deterrence, is that, do, do we have to accept mentally that uh, we can live in a world where uh, uh, Kim Jong-un, an actor such as him, actually has the capability of launching a nuclear weapon at a large-scale American city? Is that something we can tolerate? Well, I think we have to be, uh, acknowledge that um, he, and we've been seeing um, this steady march, and it has been a steady march, right? Um, he has uh, developed a nuclear capability, and we've seen the most significant test uh, now a couple weeks ago. Um, there's four elements just to review here for a threat that we are focused on here in the homeland, right? Nuclear capability, we've seen a very significant test. Um, missile delivery, we've seen repeated steady march on uh, testing of uh, the missile delivery system. Miniaturization of a nuclear warhead that could be affixed to that missile delivery system. And we've seen some in a leaked intelligence report that one element of our intelligence community, the Defense Intelligence Agency, believes that uh, that capability is there, that miniaturization capability. I personally would like to see what our full intelligence community says about that, but still very concerning. And the fourth element is reentry, the ability to put that miniaturized nuclear capability onto the missile delivery system and have it reenter the, from the Earth's atmosphere into uh, the target. And that, uh, our intelligence community does not believe is there yet. But still, we've seen a steady march and a repeated effort to attain all of those capabilities. But as somebody who's focused on the threat to the homeland, we have to be very clear about where Kim Jong-un is on that march. And so we should be focused on, in my view, deterrence. We should have a clear view about what, where he is on that a steady march to get those capabilities. We should be increasing our defense capability, and we are steadily doing that. We should be um, uh, reassuring our partners and allies and working with them, South Korea and Japan being uh, first among them, quite obviously. We should be working on a covert and other means to sabotage, derail, slow, uh, and roll back, hopefully, uh, the uh, gains that Kim Jong-un ha has made and applying steady and increased pressure, including sanctions, and I uh, give uh, credit to, and I think the administration should be given credit for the successes they have had at the UN in unanimous Security Council resolutions. Uh, but those, uh, you know, and some of the weaknesses of some of them have already been pointed out, but nevertheless, uh, they have been unanimous resolutions, and that has been very important. But we can do some on our own as well. Unilateral sanctions from the United States, pressure on uh, China and Chinese banks that continue uh, to, do, uh, to do business 
uh, with North Korea. So those are the, uh, the tools that I think we should be employing all toward, uh, hopefully, a diplomatic uh, solution to this. So uh, this week is also the 16th uh, anniversary of 9-11, and we've uh, held uh, uh, this distinguished lectureship uh, many times uh, on this anniversary. So it is a good time to reflect on that issue, which is, you know, uh, take a lot of your time, I'm yeah. sure, in the, in the White House. And I want you to, you know, could you reflect uh, to, uh, for us as well? I mean, if you look on the one hand, 16 years, uh, there hasn't been any sort of attack, even an order of magnitude the size of 9-11 uh, of uh, here, right? Knock on wood, of course. Uh, and um, so on that grounds, you'd have to say uh, we've been quite successful. If you woke up on September 12th or 13th and said we'd go a decade and a half without any kind of thing, you'd have to say that would be a good, a good deal. Uh, nonetheless, these uh, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, like-minded groups are incredibly resilient. Uh, they're active uh, uh, around the globe. And I'll just give some statistics from the State Department's report in 2016 on terrorism. 11,000 terrorist attacks around the world, causing over 25,000 deaths and 33,000 casualties. Uh, so as we sit here 16 years after the horrible uh, events of 9-11, how should we evaluate uh, how the United States and the world is doing against this terrorist threat? So uh, it's very important to reflect on it. And um, no better time than two days after um, the anniversary of that horrible day. Um, you used a word, though, resilient uh, in describing um, our terrorist actors and our terrorist enemies. Uh, it's not a word I would use, most, mostly because I associate that with positive traits. Um, I think of communities being resilient and uh, individuals who've gone through great tragedy as being resilient. So um, I would, not to fight the hypo, Professor, mm -hmm. but I would, um, I would say we have faced a very adaptive enemy. And that's, important, that's an important distinction in my mind because it uh, reminds us of where we need to go, right? So uh, to get to the heart of your question, kind of how would I gauge our kind of success or failure, um, I think by any measure, and you've said it, we have been uh, successful in diminishing the threat of a complex foreign-directed um, attack of catastrophic proportions such as we based on and suffered on 9-11. Um, and that is owing to the tremendous work across Republican and Democratic administrations from the military, intelligence, law enforcement, homeland security, diplomats. Um, and we as a nation did a number of things to make that possible. We broke down cultural barriers to uh, how we organize ourselves and uh, share information. We uh, changed our legal structures to make that more possible. Um, and we changed our structures and we created uh, new, uh, new structures, including uh, the organization that I was privileged to lead before I went to the White House, the National Security Division of the Justice Department. So we built up a net, an apparatus to enable us to have success against that type of 9-11 style attack. Now I said it's diminished, and I use that word specifically because it is not zero. Uh, there are uh, Al-Qaeda's largest affiliate currently exists in Syria, formerly known as Jabhat al-Nusra. I call them Al-Qaeda in Syria. It's a more um, kind of accurate name continues to plot and plan uh, against the homeland. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, ISIS. So we can't forget 16 years later or be complacent about the 9-11 style threat. But we're in a new phase and we've got a lot more to do on that new phase and that is uh, the hallmark of which is the self-radicalized individual, um, the uh, individual sometimes known as a lone wolf, we can talk about that, um, or homegrown terrorists, and we've got a lot more to do on that score because the net that we built that I described post 9-11 is not designed for that threat because those threat actors, San Bernardino, Orlando, the New York, New Jersey plot from, from last summer, Charlottesville, those actors don't come in to the net that we built if they don't have contact 
with uh, international terrorist group, a shadowy group of hierarchical uh, figures operating from caves uh, in Afghanistan, communicating with people here. If that's not the trait, our, that's the net we built, and we need to construct a new one. How do you understand when and see when something goes wrong in something, somebody's mind such that they um, <coughs> take a machine gun and kill 50 people in a, in a bar in Orlando? So uh, the, the work that we have to do on this new phase is going to require uh, partnerships. It's going to require innovation, working with the tech industry on uh, the role that social media plays in this. Uh, it's going to require our communities. We've, our focus post 9-11 was on the federal structures and interfacing with uh, state and local law enforcement and our international partners. This next phase is going to require a lot more work from our communities here at home. Uh, and we've got some challenges ahead. Yeah, I want to I want to get to uh, the home homeland issues uh, a little later. Mm -hmm. uh, the great thing about being a professor is you get to push back uh, again. Yes, and so uh, uh, let's let's take a look at what Bin Laden was trying to do. You know, some people say he was just a, a religious zealot uh, out to kill people, but I happen to think he was you know, had a lot of political goals. That he was a political actor as well. Uh, he wanted to. Uh, challenge the whole uh, nation-state system that had been put in place by colonial powers in the Middle East. Uh, uh, he really wanted to create this clash of civilizations between uh, the, uh, what he believed was a Muslim uh, community and the West. And he wanted to really impose a big economic cost on the United States for its role in interventionism in the U.S. And you could look at each of these goals and say, you know, he's made, you know, 16 years later, maybe some progress uh, uh, has been made on some of those things. So how do you evaluate, I mean, is, uh, uh, is, is this movement that Al-Qaeda started, uh, is, it, uh, is it succeeding or is it being pushed back? Is, he, is it failing? So uh, I think the, you know, the features of, or of Bin Laden's goals that you laid out, are, those are all fair and they show up in, in some of the papers coming uh, that were covered out of the raid in Abbottabad. Um, you know, I think the picture you lay out is a valid one, but there also has been tremendous strife and division amongst uh, uh, the, the movement itself. You see the very nature of ISIS is a, uh, <coughs> comes from a schism uh, with Al-Qaeda Central. Um, but in support of your theory, Professor, we have what My is, hypothetical. Yes. Um, is uh, what I think uh, will likely be borne out, which is that um, bin Laden has passed the mantle to his son, Hamza, right, who has released four videos, I think, uh, in, over the last year uh, or, or uh, 18 months. Um, and so, uh, you know, is he the new leader of uh, the Al-Qaeda movement? Uh, and I've already mentioned the Al-Qaeda um, uh, affiliate in Syria uh, as being one that, uh, in my role in the White House, I was exceptionally uh, focused on, which is why, uh, quite frankly, uh, and the president was exceptionally focused on it, which is why when we began the campaign against ISIS in Iraq and Syria in the summer of 2014, the um, leadership headquarters and bomb-making factory that al-Qaeda in Syria was using in Syria was amongst the first targets that the United States hit. So that has never been far from, from our mind. So, um, you know, on the other hand, you know, we have seen this evolution and this kind of disparate um, metastases of the, the movement that bin Laden um, tried, to, tried to promote. And in, in many respects, the discipline that he tried to impose on his organization to do complex, um, lengthy and planning attacks like 9-11 that discipline has eroded, and we've had much more kind of opportunistic and uh, freelance operations, some of which we've had success against, some of which we have not. So uh, I think it has, it has diminished in its cohesion, uh, if nothing else. Okay, let's turn to Syria, since you mentioned that. Uh, I'm sure it took up a large share of your time in the White House. Um, uh, again, let's start kind of a high-level uh, spot. Uh, 
you know, did, did the Obama administration let the, and the United States let the Syrian people down by not intervening in 2012 when the Civil War was uh, you know, being heavily contested and there was a chance to topple the Assad regime? You know, looking back, uh, there have been almost half a million people uh, killed in Syria, uh, six million people internally displaced, over four million refugees. It's only a country of 20 million people, so that means half the population is not living where they were when the Civil War uh, began. Uh, from a humanitarian sp perspective, it's truly a disaster. Um, did we not fulfill our values by failing to do something to maybe uh, have a different outcome right now? Look, um, this was the hardest, and I think it's implicit in your question, uh, probably the hardest issue that we dealt with as a national security team. And I say that not by way of excuse, but uh, by acknowledging, and I think you're right to acknowledge it in your question, that um, the, you know, the complexity here was uh, and continues to be something uh, that is incredibly challenging when you think of a, a, a situation that has at any one time three or four civil wars going on within it, mm -hmm. right? Um, you t talked about values. And it's important, I think, to look at hard problems from a values perspective. I, I don't think we should shy from that. And in the, in the situation room, where we dealt with a lot of hard problems, um, we talked and wrestled with values questions probably more than uh, you might expect, probably more than some people might be comfortable, I suspect, depending on uh, which orientation you come from. But, I think it's also important to recognize that there's not a singular to that description. In other words, it comes in, in many forms. And the guidepost that President Obama laid out for us was always what is in the national security interest of the United States. And uh, we came at that by recognizing that threats against the homeland and our allies and partners was the preeminent um, challenge we faced coming out of Syria and uh, made that our top priority. What were the threats to us? What were the threats to our allies and partners? Uh, what, was, uh, what would action uh, that we took, would it be consistent with international law? Would it be consistent with our humanitarian and moral obligations? Uh, which is why we were the uh, largest contributor, and I think still are, of humanitarian aid in, in Syria. Uh, so all of that went into the calculus time after time after time that we came at this. And uh, you say, you know, should we have intervened at a, at a prior time? The question is, one, you always have to ask yourself at that table, and the president always asked himself at that table in the situation room, which is, what is the day after look like? And this is a, an issue that President Obama, I think, was, was quite public about, saying in the Libya context, we did not wrestle with enough up front. So, you know, people say, should, sh you know, was there a time when Assad uh, might have been more vulnerable for removal, but in favor of what, right? What would come after? What would the um, institutions of the state look like uh, after the fact? So um, there's a number of values that go into those discussions uh, at the Situation Room table. You have to have uh, one that you privilege. The President made our guidepost the national security interest of the United States, uh, and we went after that relentlessly in the campaign against ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Iraq and in Syria, um, and uh, deployed our other tools all in service of uh, a diplomatic outcome uh, in that country, which unfortunately uh, I don't see us uh, closer to than when I left the White House. Yeah, I want to get to the ISIS campaign, but I want to ask uh, a couple more questions about Syria. Another big controversial issue was Syria's use of chemical weapons, mm -hmm. uh, the first time in 2013. Yeah. Uh, President Obama made the red line and then decided to <laughs> essentially, uh, on the alternative, cut a deal uh, with, uh, with Russia to help get uh, large stockpiles of uh, chemical weapons out of uh, Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, however, four years later, another 
uh, chemical weapons attack. Uh, does that show that that wasn't really a very good deal uh, if uh, there was yet another, uh, neither Saddam, I mean, uh, Assad was neither uh, deterred from using it, nor did he give up all of his stockpiles. So yeah. looking back, was that a mistake not to uh, take use force there to punish Syria for doing that? Well, I think that, um, you know, in phrasing in, in terms of, you know, good deal or bad deal, um, no one should be under any illusions, because we certainly weren't, certain President Obama certainly wasn't, that Putin was an honest actor in any of these uh, settings. <laughs> um, he, uh, his goal has been, and his intervention there, um, has been to protect his client state uh, in the form of Assad, to maintain access to the warm water base in Latakia, uh, and uh, to really um, assert and project uh, Russian power in the, in the region but mostly to protect his client state. So, uh, you know, this, the, what happened in the, in the summer of 2013 was by no means uh, something entered into as uh, thinking that you've got uh, an even, uh, even dealer or, or a player on the other side who's on the level, uh, because I don't think uh, anybody has any illusions about Putin in that regard. The fact of the matter is, in the face of Congress refusing to even take a vote on the president's request, President Obama's request for authority to conduct uh, the strike he, he wanted to take, uh, and that he believed very strongly that that action, in the absence of any UN Security Council resolution or basis in international law, that there ought to be congressional um, uh, approval and there ought to be congressional weighing in on this, Congress refused to even vote on the question. And uh, so entering into uh, the um, arrangement and the agreement with Russia and, and others in the international community um, was, I think, an appropriate uh, way to handle that. Uh, but there's no, uh, there's no illusions that, and we've seen this since, that Russia was a, uh, to get at the heart of your question, that Russia was, uh, was an actor or is an actor that's playing on the level. So four year, fast forward four years later, the same thing happens and President Trump decides uh, to use uh, airstrikes uh, against Syria. Mm -hmm. Was, uh, uh, and when he, when he did so, the, uh, an assistant secretary in the Obama administration, Anna Marie Slaughter, she tweeted this. She said, finally, after years of useless hand-wringing in the face <laughs> of hideous atrocities. Uh, so uh, did, uh, did Trump do the right thing? When, uh, uh, in his response? I think what he did was a positive step. And because, why? Because I think it was um, a, the right use of that power to enforce the norm against the use of chemical weapons. But I think we should be asking and um, should be focused on in service of what broader strategy. So the answer to your question is yes. Uh, as, a, uh, as an enforcement of the norm against the use of chemical weapons, um, I support it. Uh, but I also think we need to understand and know in, what, in service of what strategy was that done. And importantly, um, look, we've got uh, partners in the region who have long wanted us to take exactly the type of action that um, President Trump did. Um, I'd like to know how could we and how did we, how could we, use that as leverage with partners that we need in that region to do a number of things that heretofore they uh, have been reluctant or very slow uh, to do? Well, let's get to some of those things we might want them to do because uh, the campaign that President Obama put together, I'm sure with your assistance, uh, to address ISIS in 2014, although it's taken three years, it's you're really bearing fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, ISIS has uh, lost its uh, stronghold in Mosul. It's almost fully lost its stronghold in uh, Raqqa. It's claimed to be a caliphate, will soon be uh, vastly uh, diminished. Uh, but the question is what really needs, if, if this was winning the war, then what needs to be done to, to win the peace mm -hmm. uh, in this region? And I wonder if you could talk about both Iraq and maybe then Syria. Uh, what happened, who's gonna govern these spaces that have not been, now been vacated uh, by, uh, by ISIS. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason ISIS was able to sweep through uh, Iraq is because the Shia people, who, uh, Sunni Shia people who live there uh, were, they found ISIS a more attractive alternative 
than the uh, Iraqi government at the, at the time uh, mm -hmm. to be uh, governed by. Mm -hmm. So now that ISIS is, is being moved out of that area, uh, how, do, how does the peace get won uh, in these regions? So, like any good professor, the answer was kind of in a kernel of what you said there, right? Um, I think it has to begin in both Iraq and Syria with addressing what um, were some of the causal factors in the first instance. So you mentioned, let's take Iraq, right? ISIS was born of um, the grievances, the Sunni grievances that went unaddressed by the Maliki government, right? So to kind of put a fine point on it, and you alluded to this, you had Sunni populations, some former military uh, uh, and some uh, po civilian populations in uh, Sunni areas in Iraq that had the following choice. I go to fight for a government that is the Maliki government that is not addressing my grievances, hasn't done anything to indicate that I could be part of an inclusive government, or I uh, deal with a group that would like to kill maim, chop off the head of my family members. So they're left to that choice, you're quite right. They rolled through places like Fallujah and, and, um, and other areas to, uh, and, and swelled their ranks with people who uh, felt that they didn't have much of a choice. So um, it's one of the reasons why, uh, before the ISIS campaign began in earnest in 2014, one of the conditions of our Entry into that and uh, entry into that campaign and deployment of forces was to figure out: Are we going to have a partner that we can work with, and is that partner going to be rooted in an inclusive government, uh, or at least making steps towards and down that road? Uh, and uh, that came to pass with the Abadi government, and we saw a number of signs of that in 2014, which con created the conditions, uh, in President Obama's view, for us to begin that work in earnest with uh, the Iraqi government and the Iraqi security forces. So uh, the winning the peace has to have uh, the ingredients that were absent that allowed uh, the, uh, the disorder to, to fester in the first place. That is continued um, inclusive governance. Yeah. Abadi's got his Shia uh, base that he's continuing to have to, um, to address. And we see Iran and its proxies making continued uh, uh, malicious activity in the area, in Iraq, Syria, and other places. But inclusive governance has got to be the first ingredient. And continued work with the security forces who uh, now swelled to, I think, some 100,000 um, in, in, in Iraq who are having steady but clear gains, uh, and we're going to have to continue to support them uh, in many respects and work with them and assure them that we will be in it um, uh, for some time to come. Well, you didn't mention the third uh, group in Iraq, and that would be the, the Kurds. Yeah. Uh, uh, ethnically different from the yeah. Arabs, but religiously uh, with the Sunni. Uh, uh, they turned out to be the best fighters, uh, or yeah. uh, among the best fighters against uh, ISIS, and were working with us just as closely, I guess, as the Iraqi army. Uh, they are having a plebiscite uh, this month on independence, uh, and the U.S. is actually uh, opposing that. Uh, how, um, how do you see this desire after, you know, having ISIS ravage uh, one of their main cities and, yep. and, and threaten to go through even the capital, uh, how can they be denied, uh, in essence, a, a chance to be independent and express their, uh, uh, some form of sovereignty? Yeah, I think this is one, and you know, I saw Brett McGurk uh, make these um, remarks recently, and I think he's got it right. He's um, the special envoy for the um, counter-ISIS coalition, both under President Obama and now under President Trump. Um, and there's no uh, better and uh, longer career um, expert uh, on these issues. And, and Brett uh, said recently that now is not the time because of the, pre the precarious uh, point at which we are um, just uh, you know, trying to focus on the stabilization operations after Mosul uh, and um, trying to make sure that that continues 
of pace. So, um, you know, his point was that now is not the time uh, in the next, what, two weeks uh, for, this, uh, for this vote. Uh, and I think he's right. We're at a particularly sensitive time on that. Uh, and our goal has been, both in the Obama administration and now in the Trump administration, to be very clear that we're working with the Iraqi government. Um, and uh, I think we've got to continue in that vein uh, for a little while. I didn't answer before your, your question about winning the peace in Syria. And obviously, we can't be ignoring that. Uh, look, uh, similar, uh, similar response, though, in terms of what is the peace, so-called peace, going to be rooted in. That is in local control of these areas that ISIS has been pushed out of. One of the reasons the Syria problem has been so hard is that unlike in Iraq, I'll contrast um, the challenge in Syria with that in Iraq. In Iraq, we had a partner. We have a partner steadily growing more and more capable in the, um, in the form of the Iraqi security forces. No such partner exists or existed in Syria uh, for uh, a good long time in this campaign. And we you know, gone through uh, many iterations of trying to support and build up a partner force, as uh, has been written about. Um, we are having uh, success with uh, the Syrian Defense Forces and with a group of both Arab and Kurdish uh, for Syrian Kurdish forces. Uh, but the challenge here is going to be getting, and it's going to have to be Arab um, uh, forces that control those places where ISIS has been pushed out. And that is a big challenge, which is one of the reasons I mentioned before. We'd like to see, I would have liked to see, and I think we would have in the Obama administration, like to have seen our Arab partners uh, bring more to the table uh, over the course if of the If they don't, does years. that mean the U.S. is going to be there, essentially trying to protect uh, the Sunni populations from the Kurds, from the Assad government, mm -hmm. from the uh, Iranians? Uh, what's the role of the United States uh, in this? Well, I, th I think the Trump administration has been quite clear that that is not going to be our role uh, and um, that it's going to have to be local Arab forces that move in there. And, um, you know, the, the reports are uh, that the training that we have been doing and that those, uh, those efforts are being, um, uh, are proceeding very, uh, very swiftly, very strongly, that the, that the courses and the training that we're doing is oversubscribed uh, to hear uh, the experts uh, and to hear Brett McGurk tell it. Uh, so as ISIS is disintegrating uh, in, in Iraq and Syria, uh, uh, we have this question about all these people who left Europe uh, to come and fight, and we know in the tens of thousands, and uh, we've seen these uh, truck attacks, which seem to be very difficult to defend in uh, many cities uh, in Europe. Uh, so I have two questions about that. Is this uh, going to be increasing the threat uh, over the next years, uh, both in Europe and the United States? And, and second, you know, have the Europeans really upped their game enough to deal with the threat level that, we're, that they are facing now? Yeah, this is a, this is a big, big challenge. Um, so kind of go back to your kind of your pullback question at the start here. Where are we? We're two days after the 9-11 anniversary. What's the threat look like? Um, you know, diminished but not zero threat of catastrophic internationally directed 9-11 style attack. Um, the lone wolf slash homegrown self-radicalized uh, style attack that we have seen here. Um, and adding to that mix, the threat of foreign fighters and kind of a hybrid attack such as we saw in, in uh, Barcelona very recently, in Paris and, and Brussels, of course, and other places. Um, and here I do worry considerably about the continued foreign fighter threat. Now, um, just to put this in some perspective, at the height of the conflict and over the course of the conflict, we've had some that the experts from, or the estimates from the National Counterterrorism Center are about 40,000 foreign fighters from about 120 countries have flowed in to the conflict. Now those numbers are drastically down, but two words of caution. One, the numbers are based on information that we know, which sounds a little bit, you know, duh, right? Basic, that's a basic uh, conclusion. But that's only because we've gathered and 
had contributed uh, to um, foreign fighter watch lists and the like from our partners, um, that's, that's, the, that's the information we know and can deduce who those foreign fighters are. There's a great uh, wealth of information that I worry that we don't have. And the other issue is so we shouldn't be uh, overly confident, I think, in, in those numbers. Uh, but I think we can be confident that they've gone down. Now, the, the European counterterrorism coordinator recently said that he thinks there's about 2,500 European foreign fighters still in the Islamic State. Uh, and the message there is c his concern that they're ready to travel back and to go back to their source country. And, you know, there we've got to be exceptionally concerned that they're going to be more capable than when they left uh, and traveled to, uh, to join the caliphate. And so the question you ask about European capabilities is, is a really a critical one. We're at the 16th anniversary of 9-11. We've already talked uh, this evening about the changes we made we underwent a sea change in how we think about this problem. We changed our orientation about how to deal with intelligence. We, we changed our structures. The Europeans have not had that moment. Uh, strange as it may seem, even though they've been suffering a steady diet of, of these attacks. So uh, the, the deficiencies, uh, unfortunately, in intra-European uh, sharing amongst uh, European countries, as well as uh, steadily increasing their information sharing with us, have got to be an area of focus for us. Because they have a, the wall that we talk about here between our law enforcement and intelligence um, communities that contributed to us missing some of the, quote, dots for 9-11. That wall exists, unfortunately, in even some of our best European partners. And, uh, you know, our, our focus ought to be uh, more rapid exchange of information and intelligence with them, but really working with our European partners, the French, uh, the Belgians, and others, to break down that wall um, because uh, they're facing uh, a, a, real, uh, a real risk of those returnees in a, who have a lot more capability. So we're going to soon turn to questions from our audience. Uh, a lot of people are listening or watching and listening uh, on our live feed. And they can uh, tweet in a question to uh, at Duke Sanford. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to give this a try. Uh, uh, and, uh, and others, if uh, students or others want to, uh, there's a microphone there. Is there another microphone over here? Uh, we'll be able to take a, a bunch of questions from our audience. But uh, uh, let me turn uh, from very far abroad to pretty close to home for us uh, in, in an ACC Southern University. And that's, of course, what happened in uh, Charlottesville and in, in UVA. Um, you know, uh, as you know, I've studied a lot of the uh, preventative efforts that we are making to try to address the threats that we face inside the United States. And I looked uh, principally a lot of what was going on during the Obama administration, because that's when these efforts really uh, uh, took on uh, a more robustness. And uh, you know, quite frankly, the vast bulk of the resources really seem to be directed at working with Muslim communities to try to deal with the Al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS-related uh, uh, threat to the homeland. And there really wasn't that much you could find uh, directed towards uh, uh, <laughs> the other threats, the right-wing uh, extremism, the white supremacy. Uh, and the Trump administration has even gone further and uh, canceled some of the programs uh, uh, that were uh, the small numbers of programs the Obama administration had gotten going. So I guess I'd like to ask you, uh, you know, what should our federal government do be doing to be trying to counteract uh, these groups mm -hmm. uh, that uh, have a First Amendment right to believe what they want uh, they have a First Amendment right to protest, to put up websites, uh, but they don't have a First Amendment right to try to intimidate people with violence, mm -hmm. to engage in violence. So well, what should be done about that problem? Um, well, first, I think we need to recognize uh, that the problem is not confined uh, to the Muslim community, certainly. Uh, and I think we uh, made real strides to try and constantly uh, reinforce that point in the Obama administration. Um, the you know, lot of 
uh, ink has been spilled on nomenclature countering violent extremism, uh, part of that was an effort to be very clear that uh, violence in service of hate, regardless of its ideological backing and whatever form it comes in, should be unacceptable uh, in a rule of law society. Uh, so one thing is being very clear about what is part of the problem. Uh, and look, I think we, uh, in the Obama administration, made a, a series of changes in how we structured this. The first was to uh, try and treat this as a matter of concerted outreach with communities. Uh, the, you know, we have to also recognize, in addition to recognizing what's part of the problem set, it is how are you best going to get at it, right? And I think we realized pretty early on that this is not a top-down prescriptive problem you can solve. The solutions have got to come from the community itself, right? This goes back to what I was saying about the challenge we have in this new phase in the fight against terrorism, which is the, the threat is not susceptible in all respects to the net that we built after 9-11, right? Communities have got to be part of this infrastructure and part of this solution. They've got to be part uh, of our efforts here because they're the ones um, who are going to be able to uh, identify and also um, provide off-ramps to individuals who are becoming radicalized to violence. So it's a, a lot tougher problem and a lot tougher for law enforcement and the intelligence community. So recognizing what's in the problem set, recognizing how best to come at it through communities, and then how do you organize yourself to do that? In the Obama administration, we uh, saw it as a challenge of outreach in many respects. And if you think about how the federal government is set up, uh, we are widest, uh, we have our widest array of presence in many respects in our law enforcement presence. And maybe uh, that was a mistake because many communities, chiefly among them the Muslim community, felt like we were securitizing the relationship with the Muslim community or with the other communities we were trying to conduct outreach to um, because our uh, chief kind of spokesman or uh, point of outreach was the U.S. attorney in many, uh, in many areas, the chief federal law enforcement officer uh, in, in the area. So we changed that tack over time and set up an interagency task force to function more as a coordinator and as a, a kind of hub for best practices with communities, with, um, with schools, with public health uh, administrators, with um, kind of after school programs and the like. And we house that in the Department of Homeland Security. And it's that office that you referenced that has been cut from a budgetary perspective and the grants that it had um, uh, apportioned to a range of different groups, including those focused on combating hate from white nationalism and uh, extreme and far right groups, um, that some of those grants have been pulled back uh, quite regrettably. Okay, uh, do we have any uh, audience questioners from, from the first floor up there? Go ahead. Tell who you are first, and then you can ask your question. My name is Matt King, and I'm a senior here at Duke. And I just wanted to know from your, your time in the White House, working with our allies overseas, who were the friends who were just great, great relationship, <laughs> and who were the friends you didn't wish you had? <laughs> um, so uh, to say I'm no diplomat, right, uh, would be to... Uh, be to state the obvious. Um, look, we have a range of relationships, quite obviously. Uh, some are closer than others. Uh, and I, you know, our relationship with the UK on counterterrorism matters uh, was critical. And I was, I was on the phone with my counterpart in the UK when I looked up at the TV and saw that bombs had gone off in Boston. It's my third week on the job, by the way, in the White House. Um, because we were so constantly uh, talking to each other. I had a, I had a button on my phone uh, that was a secure phone that connected directly uh, to him. So that kind of, that is a unique relationship, probably closer uh, than any others. But one of the things we learned after 9-11 is we had to be able to form 
degrees of those relationships because the intelligence sharing, the partnered operations, we're going to have to come uh, not only from our closest and, and best allies, but we're going to have to work with others. That presented uh, problems in, in some areas and pro presented challenges um, with, uh, with some uh, folks. But we, uh, I think, to the great good credit of the intelligence community, and I will say drawing on my FBI experience, uh, one of the things that Bob Mueller did was to really focus on, I, I logged a lot of miles with him traveling internationally, uh, not just to our closest uh, allies, but uh, building up those intelligence and law enforcement sharing relationships, which, uh, which proved uh, very important on discrete threats. Okay, do we have a question here? Go ahead. See how diplomatic I was? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ms. Monaco. Thank you so much for coming here this evening. Uh, my name is Mary. I'm currently taking a course called National Security Decision Making. And uh, today we had about a two and a half hour debate about ethics. And we talked about the, the just war theory, among other things. And one of the things we focused in on was the significant increase in the use of drones over the past 10 years. And I'd like to hear about what kind of conversations took place when making the decision to uh, extend beyond just a targeting known al-Qaeda terrorists to other kind of offshoot organizations when making drone strikes. And then perhaps not even necessarily from a, a legal authorization to use force perspective, but from an ethical point of view, how far do you think we can go in continuing to justify individual attacks on al-Qaeda terrorists, given that we've already taken out Osama bin Laden and it's been 16 years since 9-11? So, um, sounds like a fascinating course. Um, I'm now teaching national security law and policy, so uh, I can relate to some of your questions. Um, look, obviously you asked a complex set of questions. I, l let me give a little bit of a frame uh, for how we approach this issue and how President Obama approached this issue. Um, the, we operated from the premise that we were going to work with partners to disrupt threats to uh, the United States and to US persons abroad, wherever we could. But where that threat was posed and our partner was unwilling or unable to address that threat, we would act unilaterally, um, consistent with law and with our values. And it was very important to President Obama to have that framework around our operations. And he um, made sure that we were putting those operations and conducting those operations in the context of something we called the presidential policy guidance, which basically said, um, we're going to have a floor here. We have to make sure that the target is a lawful target, first and foremost. But then always ask ourselves, is the action that we're taking, the gravest action any nation can take, is that required because this is a continuing imminent threat to uh, our country, to US persons, uh, and apply the highest standard. It was important to him that we apply the highest standard we can apply to those actions. And this is outside the areas of active hostility. So I'm talking about context of terrorist threats outside of kind of traditional hot battlefield, right? He said, we're going to ask ourselves questions to make sure that we, are, we apply the highest standard we can apply, near certainty that that lawful target that poses a threat to us, an imminent threat to us, is present, and that no civilians will be killed or injured in the conduct of that operation, kind of setting out that framework. Um, and it was important, he believed, to have that framework to guide and apply rigor to those very weighty decisions, guided first and foremost by protecting the United States and our people, but also so that we could set some type of standard and norms for the use of a technology that was proliferating and continues to proliferate. And also so that we could apply some transparency about how we're making these decisions and push back, quite frankly, on terrorist propaganda about our operations. So the, the kind of shorter answer, I suppose, to your question is um, 
when you're faced with those most weighty decisions and the gravest power that a government can exercise, it was very important to President Obama that we do so consistent with the rule of law and in a framework that would stand the test of time um, for not only the United States, but uh, for others around the world who might also be using this technology. Did, you know, President Trump, when he campaigned, he said he was going to loosen all the rules of engagement, let the generals uh, do what they wanted, and mm -hmm. essentially unshackle the military. Do you mm -hmm. think that uh, in the seven and a half, eight months that he's been in office that he's uh, maintained uh, this framework, or has it, been, has it been jettisoned? So I think it's useful to distinguish two things, right? I, the question here was about, um, uh, or I uh, responded with a, uh, the policy that we adopted and uh, operated under when it comes to addressing uh, terrorist threats emanating from what we called outside of areas of active hostility, so outside the hot battlefield of Afghanistan or Iraq and Syria. With regard to your question and the statements from, from the president and, for instance, the ISIS campaign, um, I think it's been pretty clear and the statements from the military and others have been that there has been a greater delegation of authority for the exercise of certain operations special operations raids, decisions to uh, deploy um, troops further in, uh, uh, further downrange, as they say, uh, in Iraq and Syria, uh, and that that delegation has gone on. And that that has been quite fruitful in terms of the pace, tempo of operations. Um, Brett McGurk said in a briefing recently that some 30% of the territory that has been, uh, that ISIS has been pushed out of occurred in the last seven or eight months. So I think you can't argue with, uh, with those kind of metrics that that, uh, that that delegation probably has had something to do with it if you, if you listen to the commanders. And uh, I'm not opposed to that because um, I think every commander in chief should be able to take a look at uh, how uh, he is managing the operations, right, and sitting down with the commanders to decide how are we going to uh, handle this, the decision making in our national security apparatus. But I want to make sure, I think we should all be concerned if, the, um, if there is no process to that decision making. In other words, if the experts aren't being consulted, if there is not a, um, a clear process for deciding where should that authority be delegated to. So uh, the long and short of it is, I think the delegation down uh, probably has, um, uh, has borne some fruit in the tempo of operations. Uh, and that is, that's a good thing in terms of what it's done in the ISIS uh, campaign. But um, there's got to be some rigor around deciding where you draw that line. OK, let's uh, do another question from here. Miranda. Hi, my name is Miranda Wolford. I'm a very nervous first year, currently in <laughs> Professor Shanzer's course on 9-11 and its aftermath. Uh, I have a question. Uh, President Obama notably said of countering violent extremism that ideologies are not defeated with guns, they're defeated by better ideas. Uh, with the emphasis that CVE programs have on rooting out the ideological reasonings behind violence, uh, specifically with the lone wolf actors you mentioned previously, how do you quantify whether or not they're effectively achieving this purpose in the future? So um, that is a huge, huge challenge for us. M metrics, right? You're really asking about metrics for things like CVE programs. Um, this is one of the things that has been the biggest question mark in how we, how we um, use these programs and how much we expand things like the office I mentioned, the, the counter, Countering Violent Extremism Task Force that we set up in DHS. Um, and one of the ways, I think, to arrive at better metrics for this is to do more and see and research what that yields, right? We haven't done enough research. We need a lot more research on what causes radicalization. We've got some theories, right? and uh, experts in this, whether it's from the law enforcement end, from the social scientists and others, um, 
they've got their theories, but I think we've got a lot more to learn on what causes radicalization. How do we understand what that process looks like? Um, and what are the best ways at going about combating ISIS uh, and its narrative? What is gonna be the most resonant uh, counter narrative to what ISIS is putting out? What are the, gonna be the best programs that work in different types of communities? So we gotta do more so we can learn more. And so the answer is not to shut those, uh, shut those things down. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Ted Lenhart. I'm a student in the law school and also an alum of the undergrad AGS program. Uh, touching on uh, the Trump administration's strategy in Afghanistan, uh, in his recent book, A World in Disarray, uh, Richard Haas suggested that there are two possible strategies in Afghanistan. One, which he endorses, is focused on counterterrorism, mainly drone strikes, and a second focused on building institutions presumably with more boots on the ground. Uh, given your understanding of the situation in Afghanistan, which strategy do you think best serves American interests, and what do you make of the Trump administration's strategy there? So, um, the answer is gonna be both, uh, which is in essence what I think we were doing, and which I think President Trump has now continued and doubled down on in his most recent speech. Um, building up security and security institutions in Afghanistan, whether it's Afghanistan or Yemen for that matter, or Libya for that matter, those institutions have gotta be in place if they're going, if that partner, if that state is going to be able to spawn a capable counterterrorism force that's going to be able to address the threat before it comes uh, to the homeland. So I think we, the Obama administration, the Bush administration, um, all had the theory of we should be working with partners to address the threat where it is before it comes to us. The ingredients to that though means you have to have a partner who has to be able to exist in a uh, secure enough environment for them to operate. And as I told uh, another group I spoke to uh, earlier today, those same security, uh, apparat the same security <laughs> apparatus in these countries have to feel confident that they're gonna get paid and it's not a corrupt system. Otherwise, why would they continue to put their lives on the line? So it's all a, a continuum, right? So we can't really look at this uh, in isolation. I listened to Trump's speech very carefully. I heard him say, we're not doing nation building in Afghanistan anymore. Mm -hmm. So were you saying that he was not being fully forthright on that issue? Or? No, I, I would. I think you could look at President Obama's speeches who also said we weren't doing nation building, right? What um, does building up institutions mean if that's, if, isn't that nation building? No, no. Uh, I, I actually disagree, right? I mean, I think you could, you could look at um, some of the things we did uh, in contrast in trying to uh, supplant and do the, uh, the work of the state, for instance, in Iraq, in the immediate aftermath of uh, the Iraq war, um, supplanting and doing for uh, the state as opposed to supporting, training, advising, and assisting uh, those, uh, those apparatus to get them off the ground. So, you know, the doing nation building uh, is, is, I think, there is a distinction between um, working with partners and building up their capacity. Now, in the latter, you've got to have enough risk tolerance, depending on the situation that you're in, uh, and the situation in that country. Uh, we, as the United States, have to have a sufficient uh, risk tolerance to be there to support those um, security forces, to take one example, to be willing to go on that uh, joint raid with them, to give them the confidence to conduct that counterterrorism operation. All of that, uh, you then run the risk of, are you gonna get drawn in? And this is the constant um, debate and the constant battle that we face uh, as a nation, as a national security community. So uh, I do think there's a distinction to be drawn, uh, but I don't think you can really separate out the, the counterterrorism capability from uh, existing I enough in a, in a state that has enough security institutions to allow it to survive and thrive. Caitlin, do you have a question from our online uh, audience? Yes, 
Um, so we are live streaming this event. Some viewers <coughs> have been tweeting in questions. I will ask one on behalf of Syra Dub 7 I think. Okay. Um, he wants to know, could the current societal rifts in the US be used against us and capitalized on by terrorist organizations? Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, uh, it's a great question and it is a very clear answer. Um, uh, a former colleague of mine, Ali Sufan, wrote a piece and just in the last day or two uh, talking about how uh, our um, polarized environment, whether it's rhetoric, whether it's politics, does um, contribute to and feed into uh, the divide that our enemies uh, and our terrorist enemies would like to see. Uh, and it, if that's not reason enough to get us uh, to come at this differently, I'm, I'm not sure what is. Thank you. Uh, question from the top. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, and also I just wanted to say it's really awesome to see a woman um, who's so successful in national security. So I really appreciate that. Um, I'm a, my name's Leah. I am a sophomore and I'm a student in Professor, Professor Shanzer's um, counterterrorism law and policy class. And I know hindsight is 2020, but I'm curious um, in terms of North Korea, uh, if you felt that there's more that you could have or would have done with the Obama administration to address the nuclear threat there? Um, well, thanks for your question. Thanks for being here. I think that the, the professor here may have stalked the audience. With, uh, I did not. <laughs> Look, you're right, and uh, that hindsight's always 2020. Look, I think that it's a constant balance and question about where to apply pressure uh, unilaterally as the United States on uh, pivotal actors like China, right, who really do uh, experts uh, really are, are fond of saying that all roads to the solution to this go through China. They're the, the single biggest trading partner, obviously, with North Korea. They're, um, they're the ones who are most concerned about um, a, a dissolution on the peninsula there. So uh, could we have calibrated uh, more or less at various times the pressure that we as the United States, qua the United States, as opposed to in a multilateral forum applied to China? Potentially. Uh, but you can't be, I mean, this is one of the, the great things about this area that we're all talking about and that you all are studying, or many of you are studying. Uh, you can't, it's not easy, right? You can't look at these things in isolation. Um, and it's going to be a, a multi-layered problem at any point in time that you're looking at any one of these questions. So um, I think you're right at the start. Hindsight's always 20-20. Well, I want to uh, sum up by uh, asking one final question. I'm sorry we're not going to get all the students uh, who I planted in the audience uh, in uh, on this. I didn't tell them what to say, I can assure you that. Uh, but uh, uh, the question is uh, uh, about uh, careers and uh, being a student uh, here in national security, uh, interested possibly in a career, and of course you had a, a long and fruitful mm -hmm. uh, career, really starting right from the, the start in, in public service. Um, a, what should they be thinking about doing now to kind of prepare themselves uh, mm -hmm. uh, for that? And you know, for those who are going to be getting their well-earned uh, degrees, either graduate degrees or uh, undergraduate degrees in, in May, um, and let's say they're a little uh, they don't have the same ideological bent as the current administration. Uh, is, is, should, that, should they factor that in when they're trying to decide whether to pursue uh, at least federal public service right now? Or, or what should they think about? So on, on the, your last um, part of the question, look, this is, it's a highly personal decision uh, about uh, how you weigh what's, what's important to you from a policy perspective and, w and where you're going to work if you're, if, um, you go into public service uh, at the federal level or at any level, but in, in the current environment, um, I think you should know what your lines are, right? Is there a particular issue that is so important to you um, that uh, you, you couldn't be part of uh, a policy implementation or a policy development uh, along a certain line? Um, and know what those lines are. Have a hard conversation with yourself about uh, what, you're, uh, what you want to be a part of. Um, but don't, don't be scared off of public service because the current moment is one that is um, scary to you or depressing to you or uh, makes you uneasy. Uh, I think the recipe for those things invariably is to engage, uh, to think about it, to 
um, to get yourself educated, to engage with ideas you disagree with. And so now I'll get to your first part of your question, really. Um, folks who I talked to earlier today um, heard me say a little bit of this, but, you know, I like to tell people who ask me, you know, how do I get this or that job and what should I be doing now? I give you a very liberating answer. Rest assured, you are not forgetting to do something right now. You are not missing a particular path because there is no one path. Uh, you've got to be open to opportunities you've, that come your way, even if they look like they were outside of your plan. That ought to be a clue that it might be fruitful, right? And expose yourself to uh, different ideas and different pursuits, to ideas that you disagree with. You know, follow people on Twitter that you disagree with. Engage with ideas that get you out of your comfort zone. Uh, don't stay in your own echo chamber. Because um, you may find that there's a whole different world that you are interested in, either uh, to engage with more, to uh, combat, to um, uh, fight against, uh, or refine your own thinking. So um, be open to different possibilities. Don't think there's, there's one track. That's, that's what's great about being in a place like Duke. You can, you can find out all those things now. Well, with that wonderful uh, answer, I'm left with uh, two more tasks. Uh, the first is to uh, give you a very small token of our appreciation <laughs> And I imagine that you know when you wake up in the morning and you turn on some of the, whether it's CNN or Morning Joe or whatever <laughs> you watch and you're seeing some of your successors, mm -hmm. uh, uh, whether it be H.R. McMasters or Tom Boss are dealing with questions and getting hammered by the press mm -hmm. and uh, choosing between least bad options, mm -hmm. uh, that you have a nice big cup of coffee and you say to yourself, I'm glad that's not me. Yeah. Uh, and so when you're having one of those cups of coffee, I hope you'll remember Thank us you very uh, much. from the Duke Sanford uh, and Counterterrorism Program travel coffee travel mug. Thank you. And my, uh, my well. second duty is to ask all of you to uh, thank Lisa Monaco for enlightening us this evening. Thank you.